know people or I didn't have a brand image. So why would they use me? So, you know, but I felt that that is a business to get into because I had made you know, friends in the industry by then and I thought that somebody will help me out. So fortunately they worked and uh, some people trusted in me, they gave me the work and I started off by hiring third party trucks and trailers and forklifts. Right? Since I didn't have the asset, I didn't have the money to buy those assets. So, um, you know, I would hire the asset and I would charge the shipping back. So I would make my margin in between. That's how I started. And then subsequently I found a partner who also wanted to join the business. <clears throat> she was a very small partner. And uh, he came in as a partner in one of my forklift. And that is how we started gain, acquiring the asset. So we bought a few assets. Uh, business went on well. Word of mouth traveled. I established a credibility in the market. And customers, uh, the shipping lines started liking us. It all took me about 10 years uh, to build that business. So at the end of 10 years, I was reasonably well settled. Uh, I got my house, I got married uh, just about that time. Uh, I started my business, I think, when I was in I was 83, 1983, and uh, I got married in 88. I bought a house. And, um, you know, I must also tell you that uh, even when the, in, the, in the times when I was working hard or I had less money, I always believed in living a quality life. Uh, I always wanted to, uh, quality and healthy life. So I was very particular about uh, being fit physically. Uh, I was always trying to be uh, as spiritual as I can because that keeps your mind very calm and uh, that also keeps your value system very high. You know, if you are spiritual, if you are physically, physically fit of course helps you to work hard. It will, it will don't, it will not, uh, it will keep you away from home, you know, uh, it will keep you in the office more longer hours, more longer days. And um, so that's how I always believed in. And uh, when I bought my first house, I bought a house in a place which was, uh, otherwise people probably would hesitate to buy it. I, I bought a house in a, Bandra, in a place called Bandra, which is a up market place in Bombay. And, um, you know, I wanted to have a quality life, I wanted to have good neighbors, uh, and then I wanted to have my wife uh, being a good place as well. So I have less trouble at home. So, <laughs> so you know, things worked out. And um, uh, so, so 1988 I got married. And uh, in 93, I got the opportunity to start this company, All Cargo, which gave me a real big break in my life. Well, what, what we do in All Cargo? All Cargo is a company which is, uh, uh, which is in direct shipping business. It is an international, internationally connected business. We transport cargo from India, when we started, transport cargo from India to the rest of the world without owning a ship, without owning any asset. Uh, how did you do that? This is a business where, uh, in shipping, this is about liner shipping again, okay? It's not prime shipping, it is liner shipping. So in liner shipping, uh, by, the, in, by 1993, most of the cargo, I would say about 90% of the cargo, was already containerized. So when the cargo gets containerized, now there are two categories in container, containerized cargo. One is what we call as full container load. If somebody has got uh, 20 tons of cargo to go from one place to the other place, which gets shipped in a full container. So you don't you have to pay for the full container freight, whatever that costs you from say India to UK, it may cost you $1,500. So you pay fifteen hundred dollars, you get a space of uh, you get a container. You should, you, uh, you know use your use that container to ship your cargo to the final destination. But suppose you don't have a twenty ton cargo, then what do you do? Then you ship your cargo in a way which is called less than container load. So less than container load is anything between five tons, two tons, ten tons, twelve tons, half a ton, hundred kgs, one and a half tons. 3 tons, you know, those kind of cargo. So you obviously don't want to pay $1,500 for a 1 ton or a 3 ton cargo, why would you pay? So there are multiple shippers or exporters who have LCL cargo and uh, they are the ones who are our customers. And these customers also in those days used to use the shipping lines to ship the LCL cargo. So for shipping lines, this is a very small business because they are very large, very large global players and uh, it was not their main area of strength or main area of interest. 
So globally, company like All Cargo had already started business uh, in those days. So, uh, so we pioneered bringing that concept into India. So because I was in the shipping business, I used to interact with the industry members because of my transport business, my relation to the shipping agencies, shipping industry, I knew what was going to come. So fortunately, I've been able to get hold of a very large uh, international network who had, a, who had an agent in India at that time. So I was fortunate to get that agency or they get, they get that association, leave the previous agent and then come to us. So we tied up that arrangement and then we started that business uh, first in Bombay and uh, we fortunately we've been able to uh, uh, settle that business very quickly and within one year we started expanding that business into multiple locations. So within the next two years, two and a half years, uh, we set about 18 offices all over the country and uh, in, about three, uh, in about four years time I, I decided to go out of India with the uh, international company who I was representing in India. So we decided to set up offices outside India. We set up two offices to begin with. We went into Dubai and we went into Singapore. So these two places we had a joint venture. And so my association with this international company became even more closer. So we did a great job with them. They were very happy about what we did for them in India. And uh, then because of that, they had that confidence in me and we decided to set up these offices uh, and they were very happy to do that. So that is how the relationship uh, built with those guys. So, um, so this happened, uh, I think, 93 to about 2001 or 2003. So this tie up and the growth of all cargo in the LCL business happened. In 2004, we set up a first container freight station in Navashiva. A container freight station is a bonded area uh, in an area of about 10 acres. We bought 10 acres of land and uh, then obviously then expanded that uh, 10, 10 acres into 22 acres and developed that facility. So that container freight station became uh, one of the most popular container freight stations in JBG. Again, the relationship with the people in the industry was good and uh, since we came from the transportation industry uh, in container freight station, transportation plays a very important role. And also, uh, uh, the business was expanding. If you, if you recall, India's real uh, economic uh, growth happened in the 20th century. Although the initiative happened in 91, but 91 to 2000, the liberalization didn't really happen in the speed in which it happened post-2000. So we were right at the time when the, you know, the globalization, the explosion of business, inbound, outbound, was taking place in the country. So container free station is basically where the ships discharge the container and the containers had to be moved from the port into an outlying area, which is about 10, 12 kilometers outside the port. So that is what there is a bonded area where the customs uh, operate from there. They sit in that facility and they clear the they clear the cargo, and the duty is also paid out of the same facility which we built. Uh, this is uh, you know by the time Bombay port has already lost the container traffic. Container traffic is already moved to Navashiv. Navashiv is a port which is about 70 kilometers outside Bombay because they wanted to decongest Bombay. Bombay didn't have enough depth of water to bring bigger ships. So that's why Navashiva was built. So by 2003-04, all the container business from Bombay port had already moved to Navashiva. So that is how we also moved into Navashiva. So uh, we built a container freight station and um, uh, you know, uh, at that time, the lot of foreign money was also coming into India. The investors, the foreign investors, institutions were looking always to invest in good companies. I don't know how much you know about private equity investment. Uh, private equity uh, is a concept where the uh, companies, the private equity uh, organizations in the world, they uh, go out and raise money. They raise money generally from high net worth individuals. You know the people who make a lot of money, but they don't know, don't know the, don't know where to put their money, or they may be. Uh, they want to diversify their portfolio because if you have 100 rupees, you don't want to put every 100 rupees into one business. You want to diversify your portfolio. So even somebody like me, uh, I don't want to keep all my wealth in, in my own company. I mean, like to spread my money into different uh, segments uh, of businesses. So they raise money from people like us and they also raise money from large institutions. They also raise money from uh, pension funds. Pension funds runs 
you know, have billions and billions of dollars in outside India. You have large universities like Harvard uh, uh, campus have maybe oh, they may have about you know well close to about 800 billions of dollars. So all these universities, the pension funds, the mutual funds, so they have surplus funds which they give to the private equity, and the private equity companies they go out and look for companies, uh, growth companies, and they identify them and they buy. Uh, sometimes they buy them out fully, and sometimes they do uh, do a minority investment. So they do that investment, help the company to grow, and three years, four years, five years down the line, they sell those shares or sell those companies. So that is called the private equity model. So these private equity were looking, I mean, there are many private equities operating in India. Uh, they are Indian origin, but uh, predominantly the private equity money comes from overseas. So this overseas, uh, one of the overseas uh, private equity company was showing a lot of interest to uh, invest in our company. Um, so we allowed the private equity to buy 6% of our shares uh, at that time. And uh, to my surprise, they valued our company already in 2003 for 1,000 crore. Uh, which was a, you know, quite, a, quite a shock, but you know, I said, good, so we needed money uh, for the growth of the company. When they invest in equity, you know, equity is not like loan, I'm sure you know. When you take a loan, you're liable to pay interest and you're liable to repay the entire loan. But in a private equity investment, you neither have a responsibility to pay a, uh, interest, nor you have a responsibility to return the money. But that doesn't mean they're giving you money for free. Okay, they have an expectation to earn at least 20% out of you. So if you don't, if the, okay, suppose they make a mistake and they are not able to get that return, then they write off and they leave or they sell at whatever price and they leave your company. But it is not always good for the company because you know, then your company's image goes back. Remember the brand value? So brand value is extremely important. If people make money out of you, they give you more money. So always money attracts money. So because I get, got my first money, I, I can take it and blow it up. I made sure that I invested that money well. So, you know, the company has done well, the company has grown, the investors are happy, and today we have a reputation in the market uh, that Orkog is a company which is, which is doing a good job. Uh, we, although we have not been able to deliver the kind of return that they are expecting because, and for different reasons, we'll come to that later. So, they made that investment and uh, we used that money to invest in other places. So, like Mr. Vanjanathana said, that uh, in 2005, we've been able to acquire that international company uh, who, we, who they partnered with for the first time. That was simply because what happened was that company went into too quick a growth. Uh, they didn't organize their business in a manner where they were able to understand what's really going on on a day-to-day -day basis. They took too many risks. They got into multiple businesses which was not their core business. Uh, and they created pockets where the money was getting lost. And they didn't have a good team of people, there was no right structure of managing the company, the finance people in the organization were not of a great caliber, so they, they went down very, very quickly. So the company got into trouble. And uh, for me, I had personally had no choice but to save the company because I was already a partner with them in Dubai and Singapore, and my India business was depending a lot on them. Uh, I could have gone out and you know, looked for other network partners, but but it was a, it was a tough, it was an effort, and they used to send me a lot of business to India. We used to make good profit out of that business as well. So I decided to look at the company. We looked at it, and, and also I knew the people. I knew that what kind of effort and what kind of energy that they have spent in building that organization. And uh, for me, it could have been a disaster that you know let that company go. And uh, I decided to take a look at investing in that company. I think that was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. Um, so, initially, that, you know, I made the right decision, but I was extremely cautious. I told them that, uh, you know, first of all, I raised that, I sold that 6% of my shares to the private equity, what I told you. I used that 6% to buy 30% of that company. I didn't put my personal money. I didn't put my company into any kind of a financial risk. Tomorrow, my investment would have gone bad. My India company would have still survived. I would have still been doing, you know, okay, maybe 20% less, but I would have been still very happy uh, where I was. So I, I didn't become greedy. I, but I told him that I will buy 33% today, but 
but I must have a right to go up to 50%. Uh, in, a, in a private limited company, uh, you know that once somebody has a 51%, they control the board. Once they control the board, then they can keep you out of all the management of day to day of the company. So I don't want to get into that scenario uh, because, you know, end of the day, friends and everything is fine, but in, when it comes to business, it has to be business, right? So 51%, I, I was not willing to give it to them. I said 50 50, but you must give me time to buy the balance 10% after 17% within one year. So by the end of one year, we decided to buy the 50%. So we became 50 50. And uh, unfortunately or fortunately, my partner, their financial trouble was continuing. So within six months down the line, they decided to sell the balance 50%. And by that time, we were very well in the company. We understood what's the problem. We tried to fix most of the problems. We sent some people from India uh, into different different corners of the world and uh, understood that business well and then, then able to uh, stabilize the company. So, so that's how the acquisition of Equiline happened. When we acquired that company, they already were having their own offices in 140 locations worldwide. So it gave me an international footprint. But I tell you, the five, six years uh, was the, the best decision, but it was the most difficult time of my life. Um, I had, uh, you know, I had uh, not only in terms of uh, the physical work, also in terms of, uh, you know, thinking about, or uh, not thinking about, learning about international cultures, uh, understanding the organizational structures, understanding about. Uh, uh, Dealing with uh, banks, uh, understanding about um, you know uh, the relationship that one need to build with the international customers, how to deal with them, etc., etc., etc. There is uh, there is tremendous amount of learning that uh, that that I had to go through. Uh, but I had no regrets because, as I told you from the beginning, I'm always very open to learn. I'm always very open to learn, even for my son or my daughter or even from you. I'm always very open to learn because I know that I know I don't know it all. You will never know it all. No matter you are a, you are, you are a PhD or maybe you are uh, whoever, you know, there is you learn every day. Because the, the world is so vast. You know, there are so many things that, that even in your own profession that, that, that even you have to learn even today. So, so that's how the whole acquisition went. And uh, fortunately, you know, when we acquired the company in 2006, the margin of business was just about 1.5%. Although the top line was close to about $400 million, but the revenue, the bottom line, the profit was only 1.5%, which is uh, not abnormal because there are many companies have that. But we've been able to take that 1.5% today to close to 7% after we acquired the company. And there's no rocket science. It's all common sense. It's all controlling your mind, controlling your ego, you know, having a relationship with your people, telling them what to do, uh, you know, form a team, you know, work together. You know, exchange ideas and then decide whatever is the best for you and take a decision. Sometimes people may not agree, but you know, democracy always doesn't work. So where democracy doesn't work, you have to put your foot down and say this is what it is. And uh, I'm, I'm very sorry to say that I must have terminated over 100 people uh, in the six years. So I had to do it. I had no other choice. Because uh, when people don't listen uh, repeatedly, uh, then you have no choice but to do it. So. So you have to be ruthless when it is required. Uh, but you know, you, but you cannot be arrogant. You have to ground yourself and uh, do things uh, when it is the uh, right time. Sometimes you have to tolerate some nonsense from people because timing is not there. So you have to wait for your time. So you have to be cunning also sometimes. So, you know, so that's that's part of life. So that's where we are. And uh, you know, in the meantime, we didn't stop uh, only the growth of international business. We also spent a lot of time developing our business in India. From the time we went public, uh, our uh, profits went up almost five times. Uh, our uh, asset base increased almost three times. Uh, so we made good investments. Uh, we built a very good brand value of all cargo, not only in India, even outside India. We won multiple awards. Um, we, we have a very good team of people you know, branding is not only required for customers, the branding is also required for you to attract good people into your organization. You know, today if you walk into I am Mahmoud I am Bangalore, I'm sure people will join us. Although we don't go there with good people, because, you know, our business doesn't need uh, uh, that level of people today. 
because we are a growing organization, we do a lot of lateral hiring, uh, not only from the campus. So uh, we need all these people at a little mature level and also at the bottom. So we add people at both levels in our organization. Um, we also now started the hiring people uh, outside India from the campus. We last year we recruited uh, five people in Singapore from one of the uh, business institutions there and you know, placing those people in the Asian markets, um, things like that. So at the end, uh, as I stand, um, we have close to about 8,000 people in the group altogether. Um, we have a top line which, which is revenue of close to about uh, $850 million. Uh, our vision is to be a billion dollar in the next uh, year or two. Um, but making money is not, not only our vision. Our vision is to, uh, to be the pioneers in the logistic business globally. Uh, and uh, while we do all this, <coughs> uh, we don't forget the society. We don't forget to give it back to the society. Um, we build, uh, uh, or not build only, we, we support a lot of education institutions. We support uh, students who are deprived. Uh, we support uh, uh, students for education. Uh, we support sports. We spend money on uh, med medical assistance. Um, so in other words, we have a, a corporate social responsibility cell in the company, which uh, we spend a lot of time in researching to find out uh, where the money can be spent uh, in the right way, out of our hands. So we don't believe in just giving the money to, to some NGOs. We want to make sure that the money is spent with the right people. We have two people working already in the CSR department. Uh, one gentleman is here in uh, Mangalore, and uh, uh, he, he works in this area to identify uh, places where we can, we can fund genuine places, uh, genuine people. And uh, we have another person who's uh, done his PhD in corporate uh, uh, in one subject. Related to CSR, so he is uh, now joined us uh, about a few months ago. So he's working in the Bombay and uh, in that region to help identify uh, that. So the one other thing people always tell me is that actually with all your success, you're still still a very uh, grounded. I think it's very important. I feel it's very easy to become arrogant, very easy to hurt other people, uh, but to get that goodwill and the respect. It takes like that. So you know, that's what I really seriously believe, and uh, that's what it is. Okay? So if you have any questions, feel free.